Okay, we're going to go ahead and release the kids to go to Children's Church. Littles and uh, Life Kids, you're ready to head to the back. Thank you, ladies, that are helping with that today. Appreciate you very much. Good crowd going back there today. Awesome. All right, good morning, Humansville, Missouri, and everybody watching online. Uh, if you ever go back and kind of look at some of the people that have liked or commented on the, on the live feed, you'll see that we have people watching from all around the country and uh, sometimes in different places around the world. So uh, thank you for uh, those that are watching. We appreciate you. Those in the building, it's good to see your smiling faces. Uh, we have been back here in the building for five or six weeks. Uh, some of the bigger churches down in Springfield and stuff are just starting to look at maybe going to 50% capacity this week or next, and so there's some benefit to being in a small town and in a, in a rural church, amen? Um, we, we wouldn't turn away hundreds or thousands of people, um, but uh, there, ha there is some benefit. We've been able to be back in, and so we're glad and thankful to that. Those that are watching online, we welcome you. We thank you for joining us. Please remember, uh, either while you're watching online or as you go back and watch the video at a later time, remember to like comment, and share the video to help us get the gospel message of Jesus out around the world. Also remember the online giving tool, give to lch.com. Click on that, follow the instructions. See, I made a new panel, that much clearer and easier to understand from that last one that I had. So thank you for all of you that do that. Listen, you know, when we first started using that online tool, we would have one or two people a month that were using it. Now we have more uh, individuals, uh, well, it's getting close to where it's almost about 40% of our giving comes in online. And uh, so we're excited about that. So you can keep giving the old-fashioned, traditional way, write a check. You can use your debit card and put your number there on the envelope or, or however you want to do that. But just always remember that that's available to you. We have a great opportunity coming up this week to be a blessing to a whole lot of people and uh, we're going to need some help with that. We talked about it here in the room ahead of time. But on June 18th, uh, we have a semi-truck load of produce coming that we are going to distribute through our church and four or five other churches. So uh, we need a few guys early in the morning to unload the semi. And then the drive through blessing will begin at 6 p.m. Those that are watching online that want to come and get that, you need to line up on Hancock Street like we've done in the past. We'll let several vehicles in at a time and, and uh, get through that line uh, as quickly as possible. This is not an income-based give out. This is not because you're poor or because you're needy. This is we have 880 cases of produce coming, and for uh, my sanity, please come and get some. Uh, we do not have refrigerator space to store uh, 80 cases of produce, let alone 880 cases, so we need to get rid of all of it on Thursday night, and so uh, help us get the word out. Share the posts that are on Facebook so that everybody in the community will know, okay? We'll need those workers uh, in the evening with doing that, 5.30, 5.45, um, we'll, we'll have that go. Okay, so let's get to the word this morning. I've titled the message today, Get Out of Your Boat. Get out of your boat. And uh, it'll all make more sense here. Some of you already know where I'm headed, but it's going to be good. I've shared with you that I've been reading this book called Jesus Called and He Wants His Church Back by Ray Johnson, Johnston. Some books take me a while to get through because they're so full of great teaching. It takes a lot longer to absorb and to, and to mull over the, the thoughts and the ideas and the, the illustrations that they're sharing. And this is one of those books. I've been, I've been reading it for about a month. I'm about two-thirds of the way through it. And uh, every time I pick it up, man... Uh, I think it was Tina was showing me a book of hers, and she's like, I highlight my book. Honey, you ain't seen nothing until you see this book. I mean, there's hardly a page in the book that has got something highlighted in it, and stars and asterisks, and there's sticky notes and tabs here and there, and it's just, wow, it's so, so full. And uh, so, uh, as I've been reading through this, this week, Johnston uh, was talking about fear and the idol of safety. And I might change that from the idol of safety to the idol of security, okay? Feelings of being secure. And so that's what we're going to talk about here for just a little bit. That thought that he shared struck me 
We've been talking in the past couple weeks about the day of Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the empowering of the believer for service, for ministry, and it struck me too many people in the church fail to engage in the ministry that God has called them to. They fail to engage in service to the Lord, and the primary reason for that is fear. So I want to talk about that this morning and then challenge us not to let fear keep us out of the will and plan of God for our lives. Listen, I'm just going to say, let me just put the cherry on top before we even get going. The most fulfilling times of my life are right now. Being in the uh, exact place that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt is God's perfect will and perfect plan for such a time as this. And living and moving and, and growing and working and ministering in this time has been like no other time in my life. Well, you're the preacher. It's supposed to be like that. No, it's not just for me. It's for all of us. As a believer in Jesus Christ, we are called to ministry. So we're going to look at this today. Look at Matthew chapter 14. I'm going to start reading in verse 22. It's a story that we'll be familiar with. If you've been around the church much at all, it'll ring a bell. And uh, then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about a few of the ideas that are shared in this. So Matthew 14 I'm reading New American Standard Translation here, starting in verse 22. It says, Immediately he, Jesus, made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side, while he sent the crowds away. And after he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately, twice we've heard that word, Jesus spoke to them saying, Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand, took hold of him, and said to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind stopped, and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, you are certainly God's son. Let's pray. God, thank you today again for your word. I pray, God, you'll help us to never take your word for granted. But God, instead, it will become uh, our lifeline, our source for instruction and encouragement and direction for everything in this life. Thankful, God, that you've given it to us in in, uh, such a a usable uh, format. And Lord, I pray today that you will help us to hear and to receive your word, your teaching, your instruction with clarity, with authority, and under the anointing of your spirit. Speak to our hearts, we pray today, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's jump right in. Uh, Anna, I almost sang the song today. I'm going to reference it later on, but what a great song to go along with getting in the water, and, uh, but I'm not going to do it. So anyway, we're going to go to verse point number one, and that's in verse 22. And it's the word immediately. When God, listen, when God presents opportunities for us to be used for his glory, he rarely gives us opportunity to prepare in the moment. Did you get that? When God gives us opportunities to be used for his glory, he rarely gives us opportunity to prepare for that moment. That means we have to be prepared ahead of time. We're supposed to be uh, preparing doing the things that we know to do day in and day out. So when God presents opportunities to work miracles in and through us, we're already ready. We're prepared. That's what our everyday lives are all about, preparing for service to the Lord. 
That service will present itself in various forms. Hello? Some of those forms will require specialized, specific preparation on our part. And other forms of opportunity that are presented to us will require us to merely have a heartbeat. Willing to do whatever God may ask. A willingness to be used by God. Jesus didn't warn his disciples that they were about to experience the storm of a lifetime. Hello? But he did tell them that they were going to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. He said, get in the boat, go to the other side. Listen, don't don't expect Jesus to reveal in advance all the challenges or all of the difficulties that life will throw your way. And can I hear someone say, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Today has enough concerns for itself, right? I, I have plenty to think about today before tomorrow gets here and has plenty of things for me to think about tomorrow. So I'm thankful that God doesn't just at the beginning of life say, okay, here's what life is going to hold for you and dumps it all on me. I just couldn't handle it. I would be discouraged. I'd be defeated. I, I wouldn't know where to begin. So don't be surprised when he doesn't reveal all of the life's challenges and difficulties. On the other side of that coin, don't expect him to reveal all at once the blessings and the joys that come from serving him. I like a little dessert every so often. I I, want to eat a little bit of it now and a little bit later and a little bit the next day. I finally threw away the last piece of that angel food cake from last Sunday's dinner. It was just starting to get a little dry, you know. But I've been, I've been nibbling on that since, I, you know, I like, I like the pleasures and the blessings and the joy a little bit along the way. So don't be surprised if you don't know about all the good stuff that's coming. That is where faith comes into play. When we trust that God is faithful, that he's good, that he wants to bless us and provide for us and care for us like any good father would. One of the greatest parts of our trip to Israel was going out on the Sea of Galilee. I've shared this with you before when we first got back, back in December. Uh, The Sea of Galilee really is not a sea, it's a big lake. It is uh, eight miles across, uh, 13 miles long, and about 33 miles long all the way around it if you could drive right on the shoreline. So it's a big lake. It's surrounded by mountains on all the side except on the southern end where it opens up. And the winds come over the top of those mountains, drop down over the warm water, and causes intense storms to stir up without much warning at all. And that's exactly what happened this night with the disciples. The day we were there, it was an absolutely gorgeous day. Calm waters, beautiful day. they, uh, they turned on some worship music, and again, that was one of the highlights of our trip in the 10 days that we were there, worshiping God with a bunch of other pastors and pastor's wives in the middle of the Sea of Galilee on a boat. It was priceless. We could have stayed out there for three or four hours. Uh, it, was, it was much too short of a trip, but um, here, here's something that is unique. Something unique is that, the, is that from just about any point Around the, the lake, you can see the towns that Jesus and his disciples would have visited and would have ministered in. It's not a huge area. You, you can see across it. I mean, picture in your mind, you know, the, the uh, uh, different places at Table Rock or, or uh, Lake of the Ozarks. Uh, the, the thing about this is it's more, it's more open. It doesn't have all those arms that go up into the into the woods and stuff. You can see across to the other side, especially at night, you can see the little city start to light up. It is in a huge area. But the miracles that were accomplished here go on and on and on. And Jesus told his disciples, he said immediately he told them, get in the boat and go. Don't be surprised if God asks you to do something immediately. And listen, the only way you're going to be able to do something immediately is if you're prepared. Be prepared. Let's move on. Number two comes from verse 23. It says, Jesus prayed. If you're wondering if prayer is an important part of your life, consider the example that Jesus set for us. Throughout his 
life here on this earth in the pages of the Gospels, we see him getting away from the crowds and spending time alone with his heavenly Father. If Jesus, the Son of God, needed to take time away from the pressures of life and from all of the hustle and bustle, the activities of life, if he needed to do it, how much more so should we as humans need to find that time to be with him? Take the time of getting away. Taking the time of getting away has always been hard for me. My wife and I have been talking about this just in the last couple weeks. She keeps pushing me. You need a break. You need a break. You got all this stuff going, all this stuff going. City, city business and insurance business and church business and, and this and that and this. And, and, and you need a break. You need a break. You need a break. And I'll, I'll, I'll schedule something next month. I'll schedule something next month. And here we are, June 14th. We're halfway through 2020. How time flies when we're having fun. We need to learn how to take a break. Listen, I'm just as guilty as probably most of us in this room when it comes to getting away. I take a little bit here and a little bit there and get this and that whenever I can get it. But Jesus saw such importance in the power of prayer that he literally pulled back, pulled away from the ministry, pulled away from his Disciples pulled away from the daily uh, 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 demands of his life to spend time alone with his father. A pastor friend of ours always says, if this church is going to go forward, it'll go forward on its knees. I would bring that home. If you're going to go forward in your walk and relationship with Jesus, it will happen as you spend time with him in prayer drawing closer to him, getting to know him even more. Jesus wasn't getting away to pray some little bless me prayer. Hello? Don't misunderstand me. It's good for us to thank God for our food. It's good for us to say our bedtime prayers. But if those are the only prayers we are praying, we're really missing out on the opportunity to hear the voice of our Heavenly Father and to be guided and instructed by him. I'm confident that Jesus never prayed, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. If I were a gambling man, I'd put money on that. Bet Jesus didn't do that. Our grandsons, they say uh, before, before we, we pray, I start leading into this. Now I've got to remember, if I can remember how they even say it. Um, help me, babe. i got brain lock. How do the kids, grandkids pray over the food? Uh, thank you, Jesus, for this food. Bless our bodies. We love you. Okay? And it's cute. It's to the point. It gets the job done. We're teaching them the importance of prayer. You know, they're five and three, you know. But, um, but we all know, and we pray it with them because we want them to know the importance of prayer. I remember a time Margo was uh, in Thailand. I had all three of our kids by myself, and after church one Sunday morning, uh, I took the, the, the three kids, and we went to a restaurant in Willard to have lunch. And when we got there, you know, the pastor is always late. You know, everybody's there at 12 o'clock, and all the tables are full. The only one that was left was right in the center of the room, center of the dining room. Dining room, you know, probably not as big as the sanctuary. So we were like right where Larry and Diane are sitting, and uh, me and the three kids, and and so the, they brought the food out, and I asked the kids, I said, who wants to pray? And our youngest daughter, Molly, she said, I'll pray. Well, she didn't pray in public. She didn't pray out. She was like four or five years old. And so we all, we bow our heads to get ready to pray, and it was like somebody signaled everybody in the restaurant, and it went dead silent, like everybody was going to pray with us, right? And so with her little voice, her little five-year-old voice, all she could, all she could muster up, she said, Good food, good meat, good God, let's eat. I, I don't know how much that blessed the Father. Uh, it, 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 it mortified me. I wanted to slide under the table. She turned out all right. Listen, Jesus was communicating with the Father about his next steps in life. Who was the next person 
that was going to follow him? Who was the next person that was going to be healed? Who was the, or where was the next town that would be radically impacted by a visit from the Messiah? Talk to God like you mean it. If your voice changes when you pray, I mean, I don't change my tone when I talk to Tom. I don't change my tone when I talk to Mike or Roy. God, he's our father. Jesus is our brother. He's our friend. You know, Talk to him just like you would somebody else. Normal, regular, everyday conversation. Get to know him. Talk to him like you trust him. Whew. Talk to him like your life depends upon it. Because it does. Listen, our prayers don't have to be eloquent, but they should be from our heart. Let me encourage you to... Oh, this will set somebody free, I hope. Let me encourage you to stop worrying about if you're doing it right and just do it. Here's what I've discovered, and that is the more I pray, the more I know how to pray, and the more I know what to pray. While I was in Bible college, uh, they did, one year, second, second year or third year I was there, they decided that they were, uh, that we had been praying for revival on a Bible college campus. And uh, they decided to establish prayer teams. And so on a particular day of each week, uh, a set group of people would meet in a room that was behind the platform area. And for the entire service, an hour, hour, 15, 20 minutes, whatever it ended up being, that entire time we were back there and we were praying for an outpouring of God's spirit in that service. And uh, I remember the first time I got back there, I'm studying for the ministry, okay? I'm studying to be a pastor. And, and the, the service started and we started praying and I poured my heart out to God. I gave him everything I had. And the church service was still going. And I remember looking at my watch and it was like five or six minutes into the service. And I'm like, what am I going to do for the next hour and 15 minutes? But you know what? By the end of that semester, I could pray for an hour and, and have something to talk about. So don't give up. Don't think just because it doesn't work for you or you feel awkward or you feel strange or you don't know what to pray or how to pray. Or, just do it and let God do the rest. Number three from this passage comes from verse 25, and it's the phrase, darkest before dawn. In the fourth watch of the night, it says, there's a... Uh, some of you will remember Karen Wheaton. She was a popular Christian singer in the, in the uh, 80s and 90s. She's now a pastor and has a church and everything. But she says, he may not come when you want him, but he'll be there right on time. He's an on-time God. Yes, he is. How many times have you thought, God, you can show up any time now. Uh, hello, where are you? Right? Let me give you this, uh, this assurance to hang on to. God will never be too late. God will always be right on time. Here in the middle of the night, the fourth watch, the darkest time, the disciples thought they were going to die. They've been caught in this massive storm. The boat is taking on water. They can't see the shoreline which is just a couple of miles, three, four, five miles away, even if they're in the middle of the lake, they can't see the shoreline thinking all would be lost. But Jesus, but Jesus in the middle of the storm, in the middle of the sea, he comes right out to them right on time, ready to save the day. And I'm here to declare he's ready to save the day every day. It's in his time. If you've ever worked overnights or been an early, early riser, you know that it's always darkest just before dawn. If you're in a dark place right now, if life has knocked you down, if you feel like you uh, just might go under, oops, if you just might go under, let me remind you that it is the perfect place for God to work a miracle. Morning is about to break. The light is about to shine into your situation. 
Light and darkness can't abide in the same place. In the famous words of Mrs. Doubtfire, help is on the way, dear. Help is on the way. So don't you give up. Don't throw in the towel. Look, so much of our life is about perspective. Let me give you perspective. If you're in a storm and, it's, and, and you, you feel like you're about to lose, you're about to go under, let me give you this word of encouragement. If you're in that darkest place, darkest before dawn, you are on the verge of a miracle. Jesus came in the fourth watch, the darkest part of the night, in the midst of the raging storm, and worked a miracle. Number four comes from verse 26. They were terrified. This cracks me up. They were terrified. The disciples of all people should have recognized Jesus. Hello? They had walked with him. They had ministered with him. They have lived with him. They have witnessed the signs and miracles and wonders that he did uh, in the three and a half years of his ministry. And yet when Jesus came walking to them on the water, the Bible says they were terrified. And Before we go passing judgment on the disciples, let's just look in the mirror. Because we often respond in the same way. We may not see Jesus walking on the water in the middle of the night or in the middle of the storm, but he comes to us in the middle of our problems, in the middle of our difficulties, in the middle of our issues, and we get scared. Here comes Jesus. Jesus, the way maker, the miracle worker, the son of God. What in the world do we have to be afraid of? The answer to that question is nothing. But the enemy of our souls comes and he sows doubt and he sows fear into our mind. And instead of seeing the Son of God, we see the impossibleness of our situation. We forget who God is. The God of the impossible. It's something about human nature. I mean, we see it over and over and over again in Scripture. God comes in and saves his people and delivers his people and blesses his people. And the next time a trial comes, the next time the enemy comes against them, what do they do? Where are you, God? Why have you forsaken us? Why did you bring us out here to die? Weren't there not enough graves in Egypt? Right? And we do the same thing. Instead of remembering who God is, we listen to the whispering lies of the enemy. Instead of fixing our eyes on Jesus, we look at the circumstances and the situations. And listen, I can promise you this beyond a shadow of a doubt. Every time we fix our eyes on the circumstances or the situations, we are doomed to fail. But if we, but if we will fix our eyes on Jesus, the author, the finisher, the perfecter of our faith, we can live in peace and in confidence and in assurance and we can walk in victory each and every day. Number five comes from verse 27. Jesus says, take courage, don't be afraid. Wow. The disciples are you know, bailing water. They're hanging on for dear life. They're, woe is me, gloom and despair and agony. I'm going to die. The boat's going down. They see Jesus coming and they get even more frightened. And Jesus fixes the problem with just a few short words. Take courage, don't be afraid. Powerful words, take courage. It was not just a new phrase or a new concept for these uh, Jewish people. You have to remember, if you've read much of the Old Testament, you will see that uh, the teachings and the recordings of God instruct his people over and over and over, take courage, be of good courage, Don't be afraid. Fear not. Over and 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 over. But we understand, those of us who have kids, how many times did we have to tell our kids? You know? Oh, how many times do we have to still keep telling our kids? Over and over and over and over and over and over. And sometimes they still don't get it, right? (laughs) God understands. But listen. Listen. As believers, if we genuinely believe this book, 
We say we do. Why, why then, when the trials come and the storms come, do we not say, wait, my Bible says, do not be afraid. My Bible says, God has not given me a spirit of fear, but he has given me power and love and a sound mind. We, we skip past that sound mind thing. We really need to focus on that right now. Because our minds are inundated with all kinds of garbage to get our eyes off of Jesus. Mm -mm. You can send killer hornets. You can send the Goodyear blimp man. The what is it? The Michelin man. You can send, send the Stay Puff marshmallow man. You can send Corona. You can send whatever you want. My eyes are fixed on Jesus, and uh, He is the author and finisher. And listen, if you know what, if Corona takes my life, glory to God. I went out on a high note, and I stepped out of this life and right into glory, right into heaven, right into eternity, because that's what my Bible says. That's where I'm going. Do we believe it? Then let's live it. Quit letting the devil beat us up. Jab slap him. Is that, is that bad? Was that a bad phrase? Maybe. I'm sorry. If I offended somebody, I didn't mean to. I mean, okay, WWF slap him. WWE probably now. See, I don't, you know what I mean? Punch the dude. Tell him what my Bible says. And I'm standing on that. Take courage. Take courage. God is faithful in the past. He's faithful in the present. And we have confidence that he will be faithful in the future. Oh, I already shared this. I had 2 Timothy 1. Did, I, did you get that up there when I was rattling that off? Anyway, 2 Timothy 1. You heard it a minute ago. God has not given us a spirit of fear, power, love, and sound mind. Fear is not from God. Fear is from the devil. Fear is a liar. Don't live in fear. Trust God. Number six, verse 28. If it's you, Peter says, Jesus, I think that's you. If, if it really is you, tell me to come out there with you and I'll know it's you. Do you hear the little seed of doubt in Peter's statement? I think there was a part of Peter that wasn't 100% sure that what he was seeing was his good friend Jesus. He thought it was, but he wasn't 100% sure. That said, listen, Peter always gets the bad rap. Peter is the only one who got out of the boat. All of the others stayed in the boat. What's the point? There will be times when what we see and what we hear will not make sense to us in the natural. But we must stand upon what we know to be true from the spiritual. Listen, your natural man will always get you in trouble. <laughs> Listen to the spirit. If you have a choice of responding in the spiritual or responding in the physical, always choose the spiritual. God, I think I'm hearing your voice. What I'm hearing sounds like you. But everything in the physical is screaming that this is not possible. But based upon what I know to be true of you, God, I'm going to take a step of faith. And if it's you, it's all going to work out. And if it's not you, I'm going to make another big mess. But I'm going to act on my faith and believe either way that you are more than able to save. Whew. Every day that I'm in ministry, I have unanswered questions. I pray. I read the word. I ask God to speak clearly to my heart and to my mind by his Holy Spirit. But there are often times when I have to make decisions without knowing that it is the right thing to do. It's just part of life. I make those decisions based on faith. I make those decisions based on what I do know. I base those decisions on what I have studied. I base those decisions on the understanding that if I mess up, at least I tried, and God is able to pick me up and dust me off and point me in the right direction 
and give me another chance and I'll learn what not to do next time. I don't know about you, but I, I'm a hands-on learner. The best way for me to learn what not to do is to experience what not to do. Hello? It's the old touch in the stove. You only touch the stove once and get your fingers blistered, and then you realize you don't like that, and you're not going to do that on purpose again. That old song that Anna likes me to sing so much, under I go. It says, I'm not stopping till I'm dancing on the bottom, drowning in the Holy Ghost. Tiptoe into it. That ain't going to do it. Why don't you just go ahead and leap? And leap is exactly what Peter did. Listen, Pete deserves a whole lot more credit than what he gets. Yes, he was an off the cuff. Sometimes he spoke before he thought. He acted before he thought. Sometimes he missed the boat completely, no pun intended. But listen, at least he did something. Peter got out of the boat, out of the boat. That's number seven. That's the last point, verse 29. Poor Pete gets a bad rap. Most of the time the story focuses on Peter took his eyes off of Jesus and began to sink. But I'm uh, I'm gonna get out of the boat this morning, and I want to talk to you about the fact that Peter had enough faith to get out of the boat and walk on the water, and none of the others took a step over the edge. All of the others stayed in the boat, a bunch of frady cats. They stayed where it was safe. They stayed where it was secure. They stayed where they, they thought their best hope, their best chance of surviving was. None of them were willing, listen, none of them were willing to stretch their faith and believe for the impossible. I'm tired of the mediocre. I'm tired of the safe. I'm tired of the mundane, the day in and the day out. It's time to change. None of the others were willing to believe that if Jesus said they could do it, they could do it. Pete and Pete alone had enough faith to step out of the boat. And something I noticed is that when he stepped out of the boat, he didn't look back to see what the others were doing or the others were saying or listening to what they had to say. Right? The implication of the story is that as he stepped out of the boat, he kept his eye, he had his eyes on Jesus. Now, I, the, where the story does us a disservice is it doesn't tell us how far Pete walked. But the fact of the matter is it really doesn't matter. I don't care if you take two or three or four or five steps walking on top of water, or you take 50 or 100 steps walking. If you walked on water... That's something pretty cool. I'm guaranteeing you this. We're working on getting our pool up and running. When I, when I get that ladder up there this afternoon, I'm going to guarantee you, when I step off of that rung of that ladder, I'm going to the bottom. Now, I'll just tell you straight up. You, okay, brother, you want to go there? You want to talk about a miracle. Peter followed the command of Jesus to come. And friends, right there is where most of us run into trouble. We are convinced by uh, what those around, of us, around us have said, about what they think, uh, and, and we don't listen to what Jesus says. Jesus told Peter to come, and that settled it for Pete. The others, no doubt, thought, well, uh, been good knowing you, Peter. You've seen some of the movies, you know, where they try to depict it, and they're trying to stop him from being obedient to Jesus. You ever think about it that way? That's exactly it. They're trying to, they're trying to whoa, 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 you can't walk on water. How many, how many times has God asked you to do something for him, and somebody said, mm, you can't do that. You're not qualified for that. You, you, you don't have the training for that. You, look at your life. You can't do that. Listen, if God told you to do it, do it. Just do it. Take a step of faith. What if I fail? Well, at least you failed trying. You already failed if you don't try. Jesus told Peter to come. That settled it for Peter. Peter walked on the water. Again, the Bible doesn't indicate how long. That's not what's important here. What's important is Peter had the faith to be obedient to Jesus, to get out of the boat, to walk on the water. Who else can say that? 
So here's the application and the conclusion, conclusion all, all put together. Let's make some application. One, if we want to experience the supernatural in our life, you're going to have to get out of the boat. The boat is that place of security. The boat is that place where our fear uh, digs in deeper. You know, anytime you do something new, there's a little bit of, anti- uh, 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 what's the word? Fear and, and well, anticipation, but trepidation, you know, a little anxiety, you know, about doing it. But once you start doing it, what happens? You're like, oh, this isn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. We, thanks a lot, Tom. You know, I mean, I remember the first time I ran a chainsaw. Uh, that thing's going to cut my leg off or something. And, I'm, and it will. And I'm still cautious with it because I've learned the power of it. But I'm not as intimidated by it anymore because I've used it a few times. I've done it a few times. Listen, get out of the boat. Take a chance. See what God will do. If you want to experience the supernatural, you have to get out of the boat. You have to get out of your comfort zone. Oh, listen, this is the big one right here. You have to stop listening to the naysayers around you. That doesn't mean you don't seek wise counsel. But listen, negative Nelly is not your friend. It doesn't mean that it has to make sense. In fact, it probably won't. It doesn't mean you have to feel qualified. You probably aren't. It doesn't mean you won't fail. Fail. Let's see, guarantees or, you know, not, we're all going to fall at some point. We're all going to fall short. We're all going to make mistakes. What it does mean is God could very well show up and show off in and through your faith. Here we are 2,000 plus years later, and we're still talking about Peter. We're still talking about the fact that a mortal man obeyed the Messiah's call and walked on water. If we play it safe all the time, we will end up with a cold, stagnant life. I want to share with you just real quickly, uh, 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 this author, Greg Lavoie, explains this idea of a cold, stagnant life because we are unwilling to be obedient to what God asks us to do because we live in fear. He says, to sinful patterns of behavior that never get confronted and changed, Abilities and gifts that never get cultivated or deployed until weeks become months and months turn into years. And one day we look back on our life, a deep, intimate, gut-wrenching, honest conversation that we never had, great, bold prayers that we never prayed, exhilarating risk we never took, sacrificial gifts we never offered, lives we never touched, and we're sitting in the recliner with a shriveled up soul and forgotten dreams, and we realize there was a desperate world in need. And a great God that was calling us to be part of something bigger than ourselves. We see the person we could have become, but didn't become. We never followed the calling because we never got out of the boat. What do you want to be remembered as? Peter had faith to trust that nothing was impossible with God. All of the others in the group stayed in the boat and never experienced the exhilaration of walking on water. I remember the first time I felt like God used me. It was a, I was in the military still. Uh, I was feeling a little bit of a call to ministry, but not had not completely, and and uh, there was a young Marine that was a, f- a friend of mine, and, uh, and he had a girlfriend. And this kid wore his heart on his sleeve, you know. And, uh, and she, she dumped him for another guy. But he was determined in his heart that she was the one that God had given him for his wife forever and ever. They hadn't been married or anything yet. They were just dating. And he came to me boo-hooing and crying and wailing and, you know, everything. What do I do? What do I do? And, and I, was, I hadn't been a Christian three, four, five, six months maybe. 
And I, I was reminded in my spirit of the uh, story in the Old Testament where the, the woman steals another lady's baby and they go before the king and the king says, cut the baby in half and let each other. And the real mama says, no, let her have it, spare the baby's life. And I told him, I said, if that woman is supposed to be yours, God will bring her back. And if she's not, let her go. You weren't supposed to have her to begin with. You'll be better off without her. Now, I wasn't a marriage counselor or a dating counselor or any kind of counselor, but I felt, but he accepted that and moved on. And I felt, wow, that was from God because I sure didn't know that. Now, that's a simple little thing, you know. I wish somebody would have told me that one of the many times, you know. But here's the deal. There's nothing like being, experiencing, being used by God. Here's what I'm confident of. Your supernatural miracle probably will not look like Pete's miracle, but it will be supernatural nonetheless. You may never walk on water, but you might be the next Billy Graham. You may not be the next Billy Graham, but you may be the next Mother Teresa. You may not be the next Mother Teresa, but you may have the potential to be the best you that God intended you to be. And the best you has the potential to be the next supernatural miracle of God. But it will not happen if you don't get out of your boat. Mm. And this morning I was reading. He said, you know what the problem is with the American church? People in the American church prefer to spend more time in the lazy boy than they do out in the world doing ministry. Ouch, we are burning that lazy boy. Listen, I mean, we, we work hard. There's, there's a time for rest, and we need that. But my goodness, get out of the boat and do something for God. Get out of the boat and let him use you to reach somebody else with the good news about who Jesus is and what Jesus wants to do in their heart and in their lives. How he changed you. Look what the Lord has done, Right? He healed my body. Man, if God has healed you, there is your your opportunity. There's your supernatural miracle. Use that as a tool to share with others. Look what God has done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. Listen, if God has straightened your life out and pointed you down the straight and narrow and you're walking and you are transformed and changed and redeemed, or at least in the process of it, that's your supernatural miracle that God can use to reach somebody else. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He changed me. Listen, if you are a a born-again child of God, if you have confessed your sins to Jesus, he's forgiven you, he lives in you, you are a brand-new creation in Christ, and that right there is enough of a platform for God to do supernatural miracles through you. Well, that's nothing special. Pete walked on water. Listen, if it changes somebody's life, my goodness, it doesn't get much better than that. But you're going to have to get out of the boat. Get out of the boat. Stop taking the easy way. Stop being content to be planted. <laughs> There's a bunch of stuff running in my head. I didn't trying to find the nice one. Ah, thank you. Stop being average. Supernatural miracles of Jesus begins with his precious gift of salvation. You must be born again. Have you been born again? Have you been saved? Have you been cleansed? If not, what are you waiting for? Today's a good day to see a supernatural miracle of God transpire in your life. We've seen one already today. Glory to God. Have you allowed God to use your faith to accomplish the impossible? Have you stepped out of the boat? Have you trusted that he is, uh, has absolute, total... Listen, have you trusted that God has absolute, total authority over everything physical and spiritual in your life? If you're not, if you haven't, what are you waiting for? Are you walking on water or are you living in fear? And so the question now for both of those is what are you going to do about it? I hope you'll get saved. I hope you'll get out of the boat. I hope you'll trust that God 
is more than able, that he can do things in and through you that you never dreamed possible. But we've got to get out of the boat. Amen? Bow your heads with me for just a moment. Are you born again? Jesus said you must be born again. It's that spiritual rebirth, that accepting Christ as Lord and Savior and him creating in us a brand new being, forgiving us of our sins, cleansing us of our unrighteousness, making us pure and holy in his sight. You must be born again. If you are not, what are you waiting for? It will cost you absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Who wants to be born again? Anyone in this room? Still not there, but needs to be. I need Jesus to save me. I need Jesus to cleanse me and to forgive me and to save me. Slip up a hand, some kind of indication, movement toward God that that's you. Maybe you're a believer in this place. And you've always been afraid to, you might mess things up and make God look bad. Listen, he's a big boy. He can handle it. Don't worry about so much about embarrassing God that you don't try to do something for him. Pray, study, prepare, listen to his voice, and then get out of the boat. You say, Pastor, I've been afraid to get out of the boat. But I'm committing today I'm going to get out of the boat. If that's you, slip up your hand. Let me pray with you around the room. Anybody? A couple, three, four, five. All right, let's pray. God, I thank you today for the power of your word. Thank you, God, for the uh, testimony of the supernatural working of Jesus in the lives of his disciples and how that uh, application applies into our lives. If we will but be willing vessels... God, you'll come and do great and mighty things. So, Lord, we stand before you this morning and we say, here we are, God. Here I am, God. Use me. Lord, help my unbelief. Build my faith, God. Help me to hear your voice and to be responsive to it. Lord, we celebrate the gift of salvation this morning that's already been displayed in this place. We're celebrating with the angels in heaven over one that's come to know you as Lord and Savior today. Lord, I pray blessing upon her. Lord, pray you'll lead her and guide her. Give her a hunger for more and more and more of you. Lord, for others in this place that, that need you in whatever form or aspect of their life, God, I pray you'll help them find you. Help them come to that place of surrendering and calling out to you. They might encounter the power of the living God. Lord, I thank you for all that you're doing. Pray you'll continue to have your way in us and through us, not only this day, but in the days to come. We pray everything in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. <clears throat> I mentioned to you that God gave me next week's message this morning, and I'll just tell you, the title of it is What's at Stake? What's at stake if we don't get out of the boat? That's what we're going to talk about. Hope you have a great afternoon. Try to stay cool. We have youth tonight. Uh, midweek service on Wednesday night at 7, and the food distribution on Thursday. Um, sign up for that if you can help. God bless you. I love you. Have a good afternoon.